God, we thank You for bringing us into Your presence today. God, thank You for loving on us and drawing us to Yourself and inviting us to sit at Your feet. And now as we sit at Your feet, we ask that You would give us ears to hear and minds to conceive and hearts to receive Your Word for us. So that as we leave this place today, Lord, we would be not just hearers of Your Word, but doers of Your Word. And all God's people said, Amen. A father was walking past his daughter's room one night, and he heard her saying over and over again, Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo. When she was done, he kind of poked his head in, and he said, Honey, what in the world were you doing? And she says, well, Daddy, I was praying. Praying? What kind of prayer was that? And she said, oh, Daddy, I had a ge geography test today in school. And I was praying that God would make Tokyo the capital of France. <laughs> <laughs> today, we are looking at the mystery of an answered prayer. Now, I know most of us don't stay awake at night wondering why in the world God doesn't make Tokyo the capital of France, right? But how many of us, hear this, how many of us have stayed awake at night wondering why our prayers for a dying child? Why our prayers for a faltering marriage? Why our prayers for a divine church? Why our prayers for a strange son or daughter could seemingly go unanswered? I mean, if God is great and if God is good, why didn't He grant those requests? Friends, hear this. There are many mysteries in this world that we'll never have answers to. But God has not left us to wonder about the issue of unanswered prayer. Hear this. Prayer is not some divine game of hit and miss. And it is not some situation we find ourselves in as slaves trying to catch crumbs from our master's table. As believers, we are God's children. And so when you and I pray, we are God's children making a request of our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Daddy, who loves to give good gifts to those who ask. In other words, our God loves to say yes to our prayers. He does. He truly does. He loves it. But hear this. There are also times that He will say no or wait. Now hear this loud and clear. God always answers our prayers. He always answers our prayers, but He does not always answer them with a yes. Sometimes He answers with a no or a wait. A no or a wait. Now, God's yeses can move mountains literally. They can move mountains. There is nothing He cannot do, and we're going to talk a whole lot more about that next week. Mountain moving prayer. But for this week, we're focusing on God's no's and God's waits. We're looking at the mystery of unanswered prayer. Let's begin by looking at when God answers no. When God answers no. Friends, there are at least three major reasons that God says no. First, God says no when our requests are wrong. If what we're asking for is wrong, God will say no. You see, friends, some prayers, no matter how well intended, simply are absolutely inappropriate. They're inappropriate. And the truth is, even Jesus' disciples were not immune to praying inappropriate prayers. For example, one day Jesus and his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, had gone up to the top of a mountain. And on that mountain, Jesus knelt down and he began to pray. And as he prayed, the full glory of God was revealed. And his face changed. His body glowed. His clothes became white and bright as lightning. And as those three disciples stood back in awe and beheld the full glory and splendor of God just a few feet away from them, they were so taken with Jesus' transfiguration that Peter proclaimed, Master, this is absolutely amazing. Let's stay here. Let's stay right here and build shelters in your honor so that we can bask in your glory. And you know how Jesus responded? In one word, he said, No. No. I'm not going to grant a request like that. We've got too much to do. We've got too many people to reach. We are not going to stay up here so that you can bask in my glory. No. Nope. Wrong request. And then sometime after this, Jesus and the disciples were traveling to Jerusalem. 
Along the way, Jesus wanted to stop in a little Samaritan village. And so Jesus sends his messengers on ahead to make arrangements for them. But when they get there, they're denied entrance. Friends, think about this. This is Jesus, King of Kings. Jesus, Lord of Lords, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, God in the flesh, has been denied entrance into a little podunk Samaritan town. And so when James and John here at the Sons of Thunder, they explode with anger. And they turn to Jesus and they say, Lord, who do these jerks think they are? Let's torch them. Let's call down fire from heaven and let's let them burn. Remember what Jesus said? He said, no. No, I didn't come to torch people. I came to transform people. And so I'm not going to grant your request. Friends, hear this. If Jesus' closest disciples were capable of making wrong requests, and they were. Requests that were totally self-serving and short-sighted and immature and inappropriate. If they were capable of that, so are we. So are we. And fortunately, God loves us too much to say yes to inappropriate requests. But he does answer those requests. He does answer them with a no. With a no. Several years ago at at 10.30 in the morning, I got a phone call. It was a school day. I got a phone call from a girl that was in our high school youth group. And I thought, what in the world is she calling me for during school hours? And when I answered it, she was just bawling on the other end. She said she needed to talk to me. She'd already called her mom and she'd already checked out at school and she wanted to see if I could meet with her. And so I said, sure. And so we got together at a part that her mom worked at and we began to talk. Frustrated, she said, Derek, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. But it just doesn't seem like God is hearing or answering or something. And I said, well, her name was Tracy. I said, Tracy, uh, what were you praying about that God doesn't seem to be answering? She said, well, I'm praying about God giving me a sense of peace about my relationship with Craig. Now, you need to understand that this is one super, super sweet girl. Super sweet. Unfortunately, she was dating a guy by the name of Craig that was a no good, never treated her right. I'm going to mess around on you whenever I want. Boyfriend, you got the picture. And so I said, well, what's going on with your relationship with Craig? And tearfully, she lowered her head down and she said, well, he started to see my best friend and he's buying her gifts and he's talking to her more than me. And she said, Derek, I just want, all I want is to have a peace that Craig and I are going to stay together. That's all I want is a peace. And God doesn't seem to be answering and I don't know why. And I looked at her like I would one of my girls. And I said, you know, it appears to me that God is answering your prayers. And she looked at me a little surprised and I said, and he's answering no. He's saying no. Because he doesn't want you to have peace about this relationship. With that, I reached over and I gave her a little hug. And I said, Tracy, God loves you too much to give you peace about a relationship that isn't right. And that isn't going to be the best for you. Friends, it took a while, but she finally listened. She truly listened to God. And today, she truly is married, happily married to a fine young Christian man who treats her the way God designed her to be treated, like a queen. Friends, if we don't want God saying no to our request, then there are some helpful questions we need to be asking before we pray. Things like, if God granted this request, if He actually granted the request I'm praying, would it bring Him glory? Would it? Would it advance His kingdom, and not just mine, but His kingdom? Would it actually help others? Would it? Would it truly help me grow and become more like Him? Or would it help others grow and help them become more like Him? Friends, hear this, if you and I have been praying diligently about something and we have sensed the resistance from heaven, then review your request. Because the truth is, maybe your request is a cop-out. An unwillingness to face what the real issues are. Maybe it's destructive in ways you don't understand right now and so you need more clarity. Maybe it's self-serving or short-sighted or too small. Or maybe 
God actually has something better in mind for you. Whatever the reason is, if the request is wrong, God will say no. He will say no. The second reason that God says no is that something is wrong in our lives. Something is wrong in our lives. In other words, God says no when we set up barriers between Him and us. Let me illustrate. Imagine that you get a chance to go on a vacation, an extended vacation, several weeks. And when you get back, your lawn is a huge jungle. Now, I know you actually have to have grass for that to happen. And I know many of us in this place do not have grass. But let's pretend for a couple of minutes that you actually have grass in your yard, okay? Well, when you get back from vacation, your grass is huge. I mean, it's like 12 inches high. It looks like small little trees all over your yard. And you know there is no way, absolutely no way, your little push mower is going to be able to bring that jungle down. However, your neighbor has this beautiful John Deere riding mower with all the bells and whistles. And before you left, he actually came over to your house and he said, Look, I know you're going to be gone for a while. And I know you like to do your own lawn. And so when you get back, if you'd like to, you can use my mower. It's yours. Well, you're actually on your way over to his house, and you're rehearsing exactly what you're going to say to borrow his lawnmower. And while that's taking place, your neighbor's little dog that you can't stand, because he's always yipping and yapping and making messes in your yard, comes waddling up to you, and he starts nipping at your leg. Well, you can hardly put one step in front of the other without tripping over that nasty little mutt. And he's still nipping at your legs, nipping at your legs, and nipping at your legs. And finally exasperated, you take a step back. And with one great big kick, you launch that little mud across the yard, and he goes yelping off. And you turn back towards your neighbor's door with a little smile on your face, and he's standing right there. He's got his arms crossed, his face is scowling, his eyes are burning holes in you. Now let me ask you something. Is that a good time? Is that a good time to be asking your neighbor to use his mower? Or maybe you need to take care of a couple of things. Get those things cleared up before you ask for a favor. Friends, God, hear this. God repeatedly invites us into his presence to share a request. And we have full access to his resources, which are absolutely unlimited. But some of us need to get some things cleared up before we ask him for any favors. So I want to give you and I five prayer busters. Five things that if we don't have cleaned up and cleared up before we go to God, God will say no. They're going to come pretty quick, so if you're taking notes, write fast. The first prayer buster is this, unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin, especially in light of the lawnmower illustration, Unconfessed sin is probably the most obvious reason our communication with God gets cut off. Isaiah 59.2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. Your sins have hidden His face from you so He will not hear. Friends, hear this. You and I can pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. But God will not hear our prayers until our sins are confessed and that blockage is removed. It's kind of like when your kitchen sink is backed up because a pipe has gotten clogged. You know how it is. You get all that nasty floaty stuff in your water and, you know, there's nothing getting through the pipe. And so what do you do? Well, the very first thing you got to do is actually admit that or confess that your pipe is clogged, right? That's the first thing you have to do. You have to admit you have to confess it. And then you got to get it cleaned out. Friends, if you and I want God to hear our prayers, then we need to confess our sins to Him so that He can clean us out. That's why 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins. And hear this, cleanse us. He'll do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when that cleansing happens... James 5.16 says that the prayer of the righteous man, the prayer of the person who has been cleansed, who's experienced forgiveness, the prayer of the righteous man is powerful and effective. Hear this. When our lives are purified, God's power can flow. It can flow. Prayer buster number two is prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. We touched on this last week. What's the number one reason the prayers aren't answered? 
prayers aren't prayed. The number one reason prayers aren't answered is prayers aren't prayed. James 4.2 says you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. It's simple. Friends, hear this. It's said that if you bring a thimble to God, He'll fill it. If you bring a bucket to God, He'll fill it. If you bring a 5,000 tank to God, He'll fill it. The question is, what are you bringing to God? Whatever you bring to God to a large degree will determine what you get. The third prayer buster is unresolved relational conflict. Unresolved relational conflict. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 says, If you're offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother or your sister, your mom or your dad, your neighbor, your, your husband or your wife, if, if you remember that anybody has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother or whoever it is. And then come and offer your gift. Friends, catch this. When God adopts us into his family, he wants us to share with others the same kind of relationship that he has shared with you and me, this very same kind. And that means he wants us to love others as we have been loved, to forgive others as we have been forgiven, to serve others as we have been served. And friends, God is absolutely serious about this. Absolutely which is why in 1 John 2, 9, he says, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Friends, if you and I don't seek to be reconciled to our brother or our sister, whoever we need to be reconciled to, then we can't be reconciled to God. We can't be reconciled to God. And if we're not reconciled to God, then our prayers won't be heard. Now hear this. You and I know this. It's not always possible to be fully reconciled to others, is it? It's not. It's not always possible. That's why Romans 12, 8 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. The question is, as far as it depends upon you, are you seeking to live with peace with everyone? Are you? Friends, if your attempts at forgiveness and reconciliation to this point have been half-hearted and self-serving, then God says, try again. Try again, and this time do it for real. And as you do, hear this, God will begin to hear your prayers. The fourth prayer buster is selfishness. We touched on this one last week as well. Selfishness. James 4.3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. Friends, how would you feel if we actually took your request that you've been praying to God and shot them up on the screen right now for everybody here to see? Lord, make me famous. Lord, make me rich. Lord, let me have a good time. Lord, I know you probably can't do this for everybody, but make my dreams come through, 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 Lord. Make my dreams come true. Friends, how very different, how very different some of our prayers are from the model that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer. We're thinking about this. His very first request, his very first request was that the name of his God the Father would be reverenced. Hallowed be thy name. His very last request was what? God, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, if you've been praying without many answers, then take a look at what you've been praying for and ask yourself, am I praying for God's glory? Or have I been praying for mine? The final prayer buster is inadequate faith. Inadequate faith. James 1, six says, but when he asks or when she asks or when anybody asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave on the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Let me ask you, do you believe? Do you actually believe that God is able, that he's omnipotent, he's all powerful, he can do all things? Do you really believe that? Friends, the next time you're down on your knees and you're not sure whether you really believe that or not, go to the Scripture 
and look at God's track record. Look at what He has done down through the ages. He has created the heavens and the earth. He parted the Red Sea. He saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. He saved Daniel from the lions. That he has caused the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. He brought Jesus Christ back to life again. And so look at what He's done down to the ages. And then look at what He's done for you in your life. Look at the evidence of His power. The evidence of His faithfulness. The evidence of His provision. Look at what He's done in your life. Friends, hear this, God is willing and God is able. And if you and I have the faith simply of a mustard seed, or if we're just able to say, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. If we have even that kind of faith, that is all the kind of faith you and I need for God to work through. He just needs a tiny little space, a tiny little hole. Friends, God will answer no when we're wrong. When there's prayer busters in our life. And He will answer no when our requests are wrong. When they're inappropriate. But there may be occasions in your life and mine, and I'm sure that there are, where we're not wrong. And our requests are not wrong. And yet in the infinite mystery of things, the outcome seems to be no. For example, every day, every day, godly people are stricken with deadly and dreaded diseases, aren't they? Every day. Every day, pain, praying parents die without seeing their wayward children come back to the fold. Every day, unspeakable tragedies afflict believers and unbelievers alike. The righteous suffer and the innocent perish every day in this world. So how could an all-loving, all-powerful God seemingly deny valid requests from faithful followers? Friends, to be honest, I do not have, nor do I think there is, a clear, concise answer for that. Truly, only God knows. But once again, He has not left us without insight. I believe that there are a couple of valuable insights into this mystery that I can share with you. The first is this. You and I need to remember that despite Jesus' victory over Satan, through His life, death, and resurrection, despite that victory, we need to remember that not everything in this world has yet been submitted to God. The enemy is still loose. He's still active. Yes, his days are numbered. Yes, his end is near. But friends, hear this. In the meantime, the Bible says that he is the prince of this world, vehemently opposing the things and the ways and the people of God and causing much suffering. But the good news is this. God will have, he will have the final say. And the good news is this, there is a day coming where every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess, including the enemies, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And on that day when Christ returns, God will assert His justice and His sovereignty, His will, He will make things right and He will dwell among His people. And as He does those things, Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the older of the old things, the order of the things we are living in today, will pass away. Second, well, you say, Derek, you know, that's great for eternity. And I'm looking forward to that day. But what about the here and the now? How is God actually going to help me in the midst of my struggles in the here and the now? When it seems like God is even, isn't saying yes to my prayers, He's saying no. How's he going to do it? Friends, our loving Heavenly Father assures us, he assures us that even when there is a mysterious no, even when he is not removing or changing whatever it is that we think we need to have removed or changed, that he has not forgotten us, nor has he forsaken us. Instead, he has promised that his grace, his grace, his unearned and unmerited favor and love will be sufficient. In other words, His grace, His promises will carry us through. I want to just share one occasion. I could share multiple, multiple, multiple occasions. But I want to share one where God carried me and my family through a difficult time. I don't know how many of you here have lost your parents, but a number of years ago, we lost Deb's dad. At the end of his life, he went 21 days, 21 days without any food and without any water. 21 days. For years, Deb's dad, Marco, 
had been a highly gifted and highly successful general surgeon. And he was a very good and he was a very kind man. But hear this, he was a very good and a very kind man who had no peace. In spite of all his gifts, in spite of all his success, he had no peace. As a matter of fact, every Christmas, when you would ask him what he wanted, every single Christmas, he said, I just want peace. All I want is peace. And it kind of became a family joke, but the truth is it really wasn't a joke because the guy had no peace. He had no peace. He also was a man who had a number of slight phobias, if you would, and one of his phobias was death. He truly was scared of dying. And every once in a while, he would make a joke uh, that someday he was going to kick the bucket. Someday he was going to kick the bucket. And that kind of became another family joke. Only really wasn't a joke because he was really scared of dying. But then, hear this, three months before he died, Three months before he died, all that changed. Because three months before he died, this man who had no peace, this man who feared death, entered into a personal relationship with God, the living God of the universe, through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. And when this man came to the end of his life in this world, even when he was drawn and even when he was emaciated, he had a peace that passes all understanding and he had a life that could not be contained by this world. And I'm telling you, to see him, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Because my father-in-law had discovered that when he gave his life to Jesus Christ, even in the face of death, he found peace. Peace. Because God's grace is sufficient. It is sufficient. On the Friday afternoon before he died, I got back to the office and my secretary looking at me knowing that Deb and I had just been up at my father-in-law's just the afternoon before and seeing me rather fatigued, she said, well, Derek, how are you doing? And to be honest, I was just too tired to play any kind of games and I said, I feel empty and I feel lonely. I feel the kind of emptiness and loneliness that comes when you watch the slow death of somebody you love and you realize that there is no human being that can take that pain away. But then I also said, hear this. But I also have this very strong sense, not just to believe in my mind, but I have a very strong sense running through the very depths of my soul that I am not alone. That God is with me and at times He's actually carrying me in this time. Friends, I can tell you from personal experience that if you will lean into God, if you will lean into God even when your prayers aren't being answered in the way you want them to be answered, you will discover that God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. Let me share one more thought around this. When you and I are in times of great difficulty and pain, it is only, only natural to ask why. Why God? Why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that or why aren't you intervening in more tangible ways? Why? Friends, I want you to know contrary to popular belief and popular opinion, it is okay to ask why. It is okay. King David did it in Psalm 13. Jesus did it in Matthew 23, verse 46. The Apostle Paul did it in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. They all asked the question, Why? Why? Friends, our loving Heavenly Father is not offended. He is not offended when you and I question, when you and I cry, or when you and I hurt. He is not offended. He is more than big enough to handle all those things and hear this. His love is more than broad enough. Instead, He says, I want you to come to me. I want you to pour out your pain to me. Why? So that I can pour my grace into you. So that you can discover that my grace is sufficient. And unless we come to him, we will not experience that. Friends, when God says no, he says it primarily for one of three reasons. One, our request is wrong. Two, we are wrong. Three, his grace is sufficient. Now, as we continue to look at the mystery of unanswered prayer, we need to remember that in addition to God's no's, God's no's, God also says wait and not yet. Wait and not yet. 
And if you're a parent, you know, in all our child-rearing challenges, that the words that not yet and wait rank second only to no, right? Second only to no as the most dreaded words in the English language to our kids, right? That's the truth. I mean, think about when you're leaving on a 1,500-mile journey in your car and you get to the edge of, the ca- edge of town and you decide you need to get some gas for your journey. As soon as you pull in there, what do the kids start to do? They start to ask you, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you're like, are we there yet? We just got started. And they moan and they groan, and you know it's going to be a very, very long trip, right? It's four or five days away from little Johnny's birthday. And he says, come on, mommy, come on, daddy, please, please, please. Let me open my presents. Let me open my presents. Please, please, please. And you say, no, Johnny, no. You need to wait for your birthday. Oh, come on, come on. Friends, hear this. Children hate the words, not yet or wait, right? They absolutely hate them. And guess what? There's a child in each and every one of us in there. There is a child in in each and every one of us. We want God to meet every need, every request, every prayer now, right? Not three years from now. Not three months from now. Not three days from now. Not three hours from now. Not even three minutes from now. We want God to answer our prayers right now. But friends, hear this. You and I need to be very, very weary about insisting that we know better than our all-knowing, all-loving Heavenly Father as to when our prayers should be answered. We also need to understand that God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. He has reasons for His not yets and waits. Sometimes God says wait in order to test our faith. To see if we actually think of him as some heavenly bending machine that we kick every time we don't get an instant response. Or whether we actually see him as the loving Heavenly Father that we can trust to give us what we need when we actually need it. Sometimes God says, you know what? You need to modify your request. Why? Because that original request was illegitimate. And so God gives us time to modify request. Sometimes God says, Wait. So that he can develop character qualities in us like endurance and and trust and patience and submission. Sometimes God says wait. Because there are things that you and I can't see that he is actually lining up in places that we can't see so that his wait can become a yes. God also uses pain. He uses hurt, struggles, confusion, disappointments. He doesn't cause them, but he uses them to stretch us and to mold us and to shape us so that we can grow and become more and more and more like Christ. And that is his goal for you and me, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And friends, you and I in this world may never see all the reasons for his delays. But if we keep praying, if we keep praying, When all the results come in, we will see God's clear wisdom. His clear wisdom. Friends, whether God says yes, no, or wait, He always, always answers the prayers of His children. And as you and I mature in our faith, as we grow from being spiritual babies to becoming spiritual adults, we're going to find it easier and easier to accept His answers that don't align with our own expectations and desires. In other words, as we grow up in our faith, it will be easier to take no and wait for an answer. And so let's grow and let's go. God is calling you and me into His presence. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank You that You are a God who loves us too much to always say yes to every request. Thank you too, Lord, that you have the big view of life. And so when you say yes or you say no or you say wait, it's for a reason. There's a purpose and a plan and there's meaning behind every answer. Thank you. The Lord teach us to trust you. And it's hard, especially for those of us who may not have had dads that we could find trustworthy. It's hard for us sometimes to trust you. But Lord, take us by the hand and lead us step by step to a place of trust. So that as we go before you in prayer, 
we can actually have an open and honest conversation with you without fear that you're going to retaliate against us in some way because we've asked inappropriately. But instead, Lord, we're going to find out that you love to have conversation. And that ultimately, Lord, yes, sometimes there is a no. Or sometimes there is a wait. But you're always looking. You're always looking to say yes. Because you love us. It's because of that love that we bring ourselves before you this day. And we give you thanks and praise for the God you are. And we thank, give you thanks and praise for the gift that we call prayer. This gift that allows us to get to know you heart to heart. For this we give you thanks. And for this we give you praise. And all God's people said, Amen.